All right, it's Monica here again. I'm on Jeanette's computer now, so I'll appear as Jeanette um, probably on your screen. Can you hear my voice? Okay, it's loud enough. No problems with the volume. Okay, terrific. So we'll get started now. Tonight I'm going to talk to you about oral pathologies, but I'm particularly going to focus on outer and middle ear pathologies. Uh, Jeanette, at the next tutorial session, will look at um, problems that occur in the inner ear and can result in different sorts of hearing loss. So. I guess by the end of this evening, um, I'd like you to be able to describe different pathologies that can affect the outer and middle ear, ear um, to be able to identify and describe problems that can occur in the ear and contribute to hearing loss, and to be able to explain to some extent the mechanisms that cause these conditions and uh, think about the impact that those conditions have on, on hearing levels. Okay, so disorders can occur at any any point along the auditory pathways. Um, these problems can occur because of a number of influences. So you might have developmental problems. Um, as the fetus is developing, there may be problems that occur because of um, development issues. Um, you may have infections in ear canal or middle ear that will affect hearing. You may have bone disorders that can have an impact on the, um, the ossicles uh, and consequently the middle ear and cause a hearing problem. Noise exposure, um, exposure to loud levels of noise over a period of time can certainly um, cause hearing to deteriorate, can cause damage to the inner ear. Aging in itself causes um, changes in the hearing or deterioration in hearing. And you can have things like tumours which can grow in the middle ear or inner ear on the auditory nerve and can affect hearing. So disorders of the external ear and the tympanic membrane are and middle ear too are generally treatable and the impact on, on hearing levels will, will vary depending on what particular structures of the middle ear are, are um, involved. So just very quickly I'm going to review the structure and function of the ear. As an introduction, so we've got the pinna here. It collects the sound, directs it down into the ear canal. The vibrations of the sound hit the eardrum. The eardrum moves backwards and forwards, it vibrates, and that in turn causes the little ossicles within the middle ear to move in a piston action. The last of the, the ossicles, the stapes, is fixed to the oval window. Or is, uh, joined into the oval window. As it moves backwards and forwards in the oval window, the fluid within the cochlea starts to move. That in turn causes little hair cell cilia within the inner ear to, to move and electrical, um, electrical signals are sent along the auditory nerve up to the auditory cortex and are interpreted as sound. So that's essentially um, how the ear works, the structure of it and um, what happens to sound. So we're focusing tonight on what happens along the ear canal and the middle ear. That's, that's the main part of this evening. I'm going to start, I'm going to try and work in from the pinna outwards, uh, inwards, sorry. And so first of all I'm going to talk about microtia and atresia. And these are congenital malformations of the oracle and the external auditory canal. These occur because of um, developmental um, issues as the fetus is developing. And these are just some images here. So microtia is very small pinna. And see a malformed pinna here. So the microtia is a congenital malformation of the pinna and it can range from a very small ear, a very small pinna, to one that's very malformed. And it's just one of a number of um, malformations that can occur with the, um, with the uh, pinna. 
A treasure is the absence of the opening of the external auditory, auditory canal. Now they don't always occur together. You can have a microtia, you can have a small pinna, but have an, an open ear canal. But in, a, in some instances, in a lot of instances, uh, you can get, you get a, a microtia and you also get the absence of the opening of the external auditory canal. Um, the impact of the atresia will vary depending on how much, um, whether there are other middle ear abnormalities. Um, so you may have malformed ossicles, you may have a congenital cholesteatoma that occurs with um, this sort of malformation. And also, j just on that, when you're doing otoscopy and looking at ears, you're looking for any sort of mal um, malformations of the pinna that may suggest that perhaps there's, there may be an issue further along the, the line. So um, you look at little pits in the, in the pinna, you might look for little extra tags on the pinna as well. That's why we have a good look at the outside of the ear before we do otoscopy. The audiometric presentation, because it's an issue affecting the external ear canal and, the, um, and, the, and therefore the passage of sound through the external um, ear canal to the middle ear, you can have uh, what we call a maximum conductive hearing loss. So that's a conductive hearing loss up to about 60 decibels. And it can be a fairly flat hearing loss. Now, you remember what a conductive, a conductive hearing loss is? Can anybody, anybody remember what, a, what the difference between a conductive and a sensory neural loss is? Okay, so conduct. Yeah, that's right, Vivian. Um, Brenda, good. So conductive hearing loss is a loss that occurs because of a problem in the middle ear or the ear canal. So in this instance, we've got good bone conduction thresholds, but we've got poor air conduction thresholds. We have a conductive hearing loss, and a fairly significant one. Another um, condition you may see that affects the ear canal is exostoses. Does anybody know what exostoses is? Are, or have you seen them in the clinic? They're, they're quite common, particularly in Australia. Okay, uh, exostoses, um, you can see, I'll just get my pointer here. This is the ear canal, but you can see there. Are, this is a bony growth that's growing out of the ear canal and almost completely blocking um, the ear canal. And that's right, Brenda, it's a, a bony growth and it's very common in surface. It's essentially um, your bod the body's response to the cold water. It's a protective um, mechanism. It protects the, the eardrum from the cold water. So they, you see these gro bony growths. Oops, missed a slide there. So the projections from the surface of the bone of the external auditory canal, usually covered in cartilage, they're a protective response to cold water, very common in Australia. And they don't tend to affect hearing unless they grow very large. So in that um, image you saw, they were quite big exostoses. Um, they can result in a mild hearing loss. And just going back to that slide, you can imagine if somebody had a little bit of wax in the ear canal, it could quite easily block these openings here and could cause a more significant um, hearing loss than with the exostoses by themselves. Another issue that can occur, um, water can get caught behind the growth. It doesn't drain out very easily. And I know my husband has that issue. He has a lot of exostoses in both ear canals. And when he goes to the beach, he's always got water stuck behind there because he used to do a lot of surfing when he was young. Um, and you can end up with uh, irritations in the ear, otitis externa, infections of the ear canal as a result. In terms of testing, uh, you can have, um, there may be issues if you're using insert earphones in particular. You can imagine if you've got just this small, these small openings here and you put an insert earphone in, um, the little opening of the insert uh, may actually press up against one of these protrusions. And so you could end up with um, more significant conductive hearing loss than you might otherwise have. So 
you know, perhaps headphones are a better option in this instance. So generally speaking, they may cause a mild degree of hearing loss. So it's certainly not as extensive as the um, atresias. Now I have have got I put some links to some videos. We did try to play them the other day and they weren't very clear. So what I would suggest you do uh, in your own time, go to these links and have a look at them on YouTube. I've got a few links for different sorts of surgeries and they're quite interesting. If you're a bit queasy, just be aware um, there's a drilling and there's bone and um, perhaps a little bit of blood. So um, just be aware that that's there. But, but they're really interesting to watch. This is probably something uh, you have seen if you've been in a clinic or perhaps you've had um, wax in your ears as well and have had to have them syringed. Impacted wax or ceremony is a very common cause of temporary or transient hearing loss and it, it tends to, wax tends to build up gradually and can become impacted. And you know it's very normal to have wax, it has an important function, it catches the dust, it has a, an antibacterial quality so it protects the ear canal, canal but, and usually it will just move out of the ear canal um, but with your, the, as the skin sort of grows out. But um, in some instances it doesn't, if you've got a very narrow ear canal, if you've got a twisty ear canal, then it may not, um, it may not move out of the ear very easily. And it can result in a conductive hearing loss from a mild to a moderate degree. If the wax is pushed down the ear canal, and this happens quite commonly if people use earbuds, rather than getting wax out, they tend to push it further down. If it impinges on the tympanic membrane, it actually increases the mass of the membrane and causes a high frequency conductive hearing loss. So you can get anything from a mild degree of loss or something like this where you've got um, a bit more of a significant loss in the high frequencies. Uh, so if you if you see somebody if you um, see someone in the clinic you do itoscopy it looks as if their their ear canals are are impacted with wax you can't see the eardrum it may be difficult to test them um, is there is there a way that you could determine whether the ear canal was completely blocked with wax can you think of if you can't see the eardrum you can't really see a passage through but is there a test that we can use that might help us um, determine whether the ear canal is completely occluded. Anybody have any idea? No, not a speech test. Volume can certainly be affected, Brenda, if we're um, trying to test. That's right, Leone, tympanometry. Because one of the things we look at with tympanometry is the volume of the ear canal. So if you if you do tympanometry and you've got a flat tympanogram and a very small ear canal volume, the likelihood is that that wax is um, is impacted and there's no passage through. Um, I saw a little boy in the clinic a couple of weeks ago in the clinic I work in, and I couldn't see his tympanic membranes at all. The wax looked impacted, and when I did tympanometry, his canal volume was 0.2, so it was very small. Luckily, I work in a practice where with ear, nose and throat specialists and they were able to suction the wax out and then he had quite normal volumes and his hearing was quite normal once, um, once the wax was removed. So this is an ear wax removal video. If you look at this one, one thing to note is that the, there's wax in the ear canal but there's also um, almost like a fungal infection. Sometimes you can get a fungal growth on the wax and you can see the little spores on the, on the wax. You can get that in isolation too, you can get a fungal infection without the wax. So we're going to look now at some of more conditions that affect the ear canal, um, particularly otitis externa and this is most commonly caused by infection, usually a bacterial infection but occasionally um, a fungal infection. It can, it's very common in areas that where there's a high level of humidity, so in tropical areas. And when I was in, I was in East Timor last year and we saw, um, doing hearing tests, and we saw a lot of uh, people there who had 
fungal infections in their ear canals. So it's very, very common. It can also originate from an allergic reaction. So if somebody's using shampoo um, or something like that that gets into the ear canal, they may have an allergy to it and you get uh, antitis externa or dermatitis um, on, in the ear canal. It can have mild results, but it can also cause very severe pain. It can be very, very itchy. And, and the, uh, the lining of the ear canal can actually become quite swollen and you can end up with a discharge, sometimes quite pussy. It's often treated by just irrigating with warm salty water or antibiotic drops can be used as well to treat it. And also if it's an allergic reaction you'd stop using shampoos, you try and use earplugs when you're um, washing your hair, things like that. Now audiometry may be quite difficult when you've got somebody with an otitis externa. Um, when we do otoscopy one of the first things we do is palpate the area around the ear canal, behind, sorry, around the ear, around the pinna, on the mastoid area and around the front. If somebody's got a, a notitis externa and they've got a bit of swelling, that can be quite painful. So you can imagine if you've got a set of heavy headphones, the weight of those might cause a lot of discomfort. Inserts in the ear canal might be very uncomfortable too, particularly if they've got swelling and if they've got irritation on the ear canal. So you may want, you may not want to do the testing, just uh, it's on a case by case basis. If the canal is closed because of swelling and accumulation of infectious debris, um, I guess the most likely scenario is a mild conductive loss. Uh, the extent of the loss will depend on, on how closed the canal, how much discharge is there and so on. You can get a malignant otitis externa and that can spread, um, you get a spread of infection to the bones of the ear canal and the lower part of the skull and that requires immediate medical treatment. Um, so I guess if ever you see an otitis externa, if you see swelling, it's certainly a, a, um, a case where you would refer them back to their GP uh, for uh, medical treatment. So quite often it's just a very mild conductive hearing loss. So bone conduction is within the normal range. We've just got a mild loss as a near bone gap. But once again the extent of the loss will vary depending on um, the extent of the, the ex otitis externa I guess. These are just a couple of images here. So this is a, an otitis externa. You can see there's a lot of flaking of the skin. The ear canal is much smaller than it probably normally would be. There's a lot of swelling there. I'd say this person may have been scratching it a bit. It looks like there's a bit of scratching happening there. And up in the, the area got a, bit, uh, got a bit of bleeding there. This otitis externa is much more extensive. Uh, it looks pretty nasty. You may also hear, hear otitis externa being referred to as swimmer's ear. So you can see the inflammation here, a bit of pussy discharge, the um, cartilage lining the uh, ear canal is quite swollen and inflamed. And this is a, an example of a fungal infection. So you can see the little spores here. So you've got the, the discharge and these little spores here. So certainly send them straight back to their GP for treatment. Okay, so I'll just go into the next part two now. <coughs> Sorry, just excuse me, I just have to have to Okay, so still looking at the middle ear, but we're going to look now a little bit more at pathologies that affect the tympanic membrane. Before we do, any questions about the, the first section, about the otitis externa, the ear canal issues? Yes, Brenda, it is pretty yuck. I can see that. Some of those images are not very pleasant, but um, you, you, do, you do see those sorts of images in the clinic, those sorts of ears. Okay, so pathologies that affect the tympanic membrane can include perforations, 
thickening of the tympanic membrane or tympanosclerosis, thin, very thin membranes. I'm just going to start off talking about perforations and they can occur in different ways. And we'll probably be coming back to this in some of the latter things we talk about. So you can get an, ex an excessive pressure buildup during um, a middle ear infection. Uh, fluid builds up within the middle ear. It applies pressure to the eardrum and the eardrum can spontaneously perforate. You can get um, a direct trauma from a pointed object such as a cotton swab. So it's very important that you educate people not to use cotton buds when they're to try and get wax out of their ears. Um, in the clinic I work in, we often see people who have quite traumatic perforations because they've used cotton buds. And I tested a fellow a couple of weeks ago who had been using a cotton bud on his ear with one ear and listening to some music and he was sort of focusing on the music and actually rolled onto his side where he had the cotton bud in his ear without thinking. And as he rolled over, the cotton bud went right down his ear canal and perforated his um, ear canal. And it was a fairly large, sorry, his membrane, ear, uh, tympanic membrane, it was a fairly large perforation as well. You can get sudden um, pressure changes in the external rotary canal. So if you get a hand clapped over the ear, you know, a hit, or there's an explosion, that build up of pressure in the ear canal can, can be sufficient to perforate the eardrum. And the result, resulting hearing loss will vary depending on the size and location of the perforation. So here, in these two slides, call this, it says central perforation. I'd probably be inclined to call this a more marginal perforation. A marginal perforation is one that goes right to the edge of the tympanic membrane to the um, canal wall. And you can see that that's extending right to the canal wall. That previous um, slide, that is that is more like a central perforation there. You can also get very small perforations that may not have a very significant impact on the hearing. You can see here there's just a tiny hole. Um, that with a tiny hole you can still get the eardrum vibrating and it may not have such a big impact on the, on the hearing loss. But with something like this, the marginal perforation, um, you can see that you can anticipate that the impact on the hearing is going to be much greater. And it may be too if it's a um, traumatic perforation due to an explosion that perhaps the ossicles are dislocated as well. So the impact can be much greater. With a larger perforation, the healing process is also um, a little bit more problematic. Um, small perforations and central perforations tend to heal more readily. Um, these marginal perforations may be ones that don't heal and may have to be surgically um, repaired. So the presentation of a small perforation, you may just have a very mild conductive hearing loss. For a more significant perforation, for a large perforation, you can have also almost a maximal conductive hearing loss. So the impact can be quite significant. Other issues that can affect issues that occur in the middle ear and which can, can result in perforations can also affect the hearing. You can get uh, acute otitis media with effusion. Usually it accompanies an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, the process by which it occurs is you get a build up of negative middle ear pressure within the middle ear. So usually that occurs because the eustachian tube isn't functioning very efficiently. So if you've got a bit of inflammation in the eustachian tube, it, it's not opening and closing as it should. So normally when we swallow or yawn, the eustachian tube opens, ventilates the middle ear and um, keeps the middle ear healthy. If that middle ear is not being refreshed, be refreshed with air, you get a vacuum being created within the middle ear space, uh, within the middle ear. Our bodies don't like vacuums, so they fill it. And in this case, the mucous membrane that lines the middle ear starts to secrete fluid to, to fill that space, to fill the vacuum. That can become contaminated with bacteria. You can get pus developing, or it can be a clear, a clear fluid. Um, when fluid develops, um, particularly if it builds up, it can be also referred to as gluey. 
and you may have heard that. Have you have you seen any gluea incidences of gluea in the clinic when you've been um, seeing clients? Yeah. It's it's very common, and particularly if you work um, with. Uh, in a clinic where children are being tested, that's right Brenda, with children um, it's a very common problem because the eustachian tube doesn't work, often doesn't work very efficiently um, when children are young. They're perhaps exposed to um, a few more germs in preschool and things like that too. So this is just a, a slide of a acute otitis media. Now interestingly when you do otoscopy we tell you that you look out for landmarks of the cone of light. And we can see a cone of light here. This is a left eardrum. The cone of light is essentially in the right position. Um, a cone of light doesn't always mean everything's normal. You can actually see, if you look closely, that eardrum is, is um, bulging and there's a line of fluid behind it. The eardrum is also quite vascular and that's um, very commonly seen when you have um, and otitis media occurring. So the audiometric presentation can be fairly mild or it can be um, more significant um, up to 50 or 60 decibels and that will depend on how much fluid is in the middle ear, whether the fluid is quite gluggy, um, that may have a greater impact on the hearing. So you can have acute otitis media, that just means it, it occurs, it's often over fairly quickly. You can have more chronic problems too. So often with a chronic otitis media you have a perforation in the tympanic membrane. You get a lot of discharge occurring because of that perforation and there's an active bacterial infection within the middle ear space and that can last for a few weeks. Um, you may see pus um, discharge draining to the outside of the ear and we call that that uh, discharge otorrhea, that's another term you might see. And it, it's very common where you see poor eustachian tube dysfunction, poor eustachian tube function. It's just another image of otitis media with effusion. You can see here, this it's very clear here that you've got a bulging eardrum. Um, this is the cone of light. Now does everybody know what the cone of light is? When I refer to that, I should have asked you that before. So the cone of light is the reflection of the light from the otoscope and in a healthy eardrum we should see it at a particular angle. We can see the reflection of the light from the otoscope but it's certainly not in its correct place and you can see that bulging eardrum and it looks as if it's on the point of, um, of perforating, spontaneously perforating. And that that is probably going, that person is probably going to end up with a more significant hearing loss than say the previous audiogram we looked at, or the previous image we looked at. So in that case with that particular ear you might see something a bit more significant, almost a maximal um, conductive loss. Tympanosclerosis is another thing you might see in the clinic when you do otoscopy. It's basically a scarring of the drum that, that drum becomes quite thick um, and chalky looking in patches. You can see it after uh, perforation heals um, or you've had uh, grommets and uh, grommets you know the little tubes that go into the eardrum to help drain it. Um, you can see little um, patches of scarring on the ear. Now it doesn't always have an impact on the hearing but if it's a large area and there's quite a significant thickening of the drum, it means the eardrum is a bit sluggish and it, it can have a, a mild impact on the hearing. Um, what You may also see a change in your tympanic membrane compliance as measured on um, your tympanometry tests. So um, often we see a very mild hearing loss and perhaps a shallow type A uh, tympanogram with tympanosclerosis. The other thing you might see, another condition that can affect the hearing is a retraction. So a retraction and in this case we've got some scarring as well, There's some scarring here and around here. A retraction means the eardrum is sort of sucked into the middle ear space and that's occurring because, the negative, because of negative middle ear pressure. 
the air pressure on the middle ear is less than in the ear canal. So you can almost see here that the eardrum is adhering to the, the ossicles there. And it can cause a hearing loss. One thing that, um, sorry, I'll just go back to this. One thing that can occur um, if you have this constant retraction, you may have an occasional perforation. When the perforation, or before the perforation heals, you can actually get some skin cells um, that come from the ear canal into the middle ear space, and that can result in something called a cholesteatoma. So have have you heard of cholesteatoma? Have you read about it? Have you seen it? They're not that common, but um, you may have been lucky enough to have seen one in a clinic. Okay. So there, cholesteatoma is a growth within the middle ear. It's a benign growth, so it's not like a, a malignant cancer. It doesn't mean it's not a serious condition, though. So you get um, you get skin cells. Uh, in the middle ear where they're not usually found, usually associated with a long history of eustachian tube dysfunction and negative middle ear pressure. If that, if those, those skin cells, once they're in the middle ear, they actually continue to grow and you get what looks like a little, a little pearly ball you can see behind the eardrum. It tends to be in the, the attic area of the tympanic membrane, so up at the top of the uh, tympanic membrane. If it grows, keeps growing, it can actually destroy the ossicles. It can um, cause destruction of the ossicles and can cause facial nerve damage and um, develop up into up to near the brain. And it can be fatal. It's often accompanied by quite smelly discharge, but that's not always the case. If you're if you're um, doing otoscopy and you see anything that looks white, white pearly looking growth up in the top of the, ear, um, the eardrum, that's something you should perhaps refer on, comment on in reports and refer off just for clarification. So this is just a, a drawing of what happens. So you've got the, the eardrum retracts, perforates, skin cells get caught in the middle ear space up here, usually up in this area. As they, as they grow, they can erode the ossicles, it can grow to fill up the middle ear space and in the worst case scenario it can go up here into the bone above the ear and um, eventually you can get a growth into the brain um, and it can have an impact on the inner ear as well so you may end up with um, a mixed hearing loss. Here are some images of cholesteatomas. This one's, so here's the attic area, the little cholesteatoma up there. You can see it looks a, a bit nasty. So if you ever see anything like that, certainly uh, refer back to the GP for comment. This is, I was referring to the little pearly sort of growth. This is what it can look like. This one, in this case, it's a congenital one. Someone's been born with it, and that can be a malformation. We talked about the malformations that occur um, in the fetus, in the development of the fetus, and this can be one. This is a cholesteatoma that has significantly eroded um, the middle ear, so the ossicles are eroded there. So obviously the impact on hearing is more significant with, um, with a more extensive spread of the cholesteatoma. This is probably a fairly typical presentation of cholesteatoma. Ten, the ones that I've seen tend to have a little bit more of a high frequency conductive loss. But once again, it's generally conductive hearing loss. Change over to the last pod. We're almost there. Okay, so now I'm just going to talk about some of the tumours that can occur, or a tumour that can occur within the middle ear space. Um, one in particular is called a glomus tumour, and it's a small, a small tumour occurs within the middle ear. It's a mass of cells that have a very ri rich vascular supply, and the, when we when we look at the eardrum, 
we can often identify it by it being a red spot behind the eardrum. Now they're not very common. Uh, I think I've only seen one in, in my years of audiology. Um, but a very distinctive feature of this tumour is a pulsatile tinnitus. So that it's a pulsing tinnitus basically in, um, in line with the heartbeat. They, these tumours, as I said, arise in the middle ear, so they result in a conductive hearing loss. And if, if the tumour is very small, hearing can be quite normal and there are no hearing symptoms. But it can grow through the mastoid, uh, into the mastoid bone itself, through the wall that divides the middle ear from the mastoid and it can infiltrate the bone. Um, the tumour may also wrap around the facial nerve and can become attached to the jugular, um, jugular vein. So this is, um, only, sorry, just going back to that, so you can imagine it, it's a much more significant issue. It's certainly something that has to be um, treated um, medically or attended to by a knee specialist. This is a glomus tumour. You can see it's, um, you can see the, the redness there because of the, the blood supply to the tumour. The treatment, quite often they're not, um, they're just monitored if they're small, uh, but if they become more extensive, uh, surgery, surgical intervention is the way to go. Another condition that is a, um, not, not that uncommon in the clinic uh, is otosclerosis. It's a common cause of hearing loss in adults and tends to occur after puberty and or, you know, initially occur after puberty and up to about the age of 30. It is progressive in its nature and in about 70% of cases it is hereditary. More common in women than in men too. I think that that's the case, Jeanette. Yeah, more common in women than men. And like, sorry, 60% six, more cases in, in women. And uh, in women, if, if a woman becomes pregnant, um, because of changes in calcium level and things like that, that you can actually end up with the, the hearing loss occurring a little bit more rapidly with each progressive pregnancy. So uh, the disorder originates in the bony labyrinth of the inner ear, causes a, a conductive loss and what it does, it, it causes a growth of a spongy bone on the um, foot plate of the stapes. So, and it, so that uh, bony growth, it's sometimes referred to as Otospongiosis is uh, causes the foot plate to become partially fixed in the oval window. So it causes a conductive hearing loss of varying degree depending on the amount of fixation. There's a very distinctive pattern on the audiogram called a Carhartt's notch, which I'll show you in a minute. The progression of the loss is slow, but as I said, if uh, in women where they they have a number of pregnancies, it can be um, progress a little bit more rapidly. You may see a bluish cast to the whites of the eyes and that's a common feature in a lot of uh, bone disorders. You may also see um, that the, uh, the promontory may be a bit vascular and you get a rosy glow to the tympanic membrane and that's called Schwartz sign. So, so this is the otosclerosis here, you get this bony growth, you can see it does a bit spongy, but this bony growth on the stapes foot plate fixes the foot plate in the oval window and that prevents the ossicles from um, moving as they should. So it essentially dampens down the, the loudness of the sound, the volume of the sound to the inner ear. This is, um, as I said, is a, often a bluish cast to the eyes. You can see that. Um, the whites of the eye are quite blue there. And the Schwartz's sign, it's just sort of a rosy glow to the eardrum. It's not like the glomus tumour, but it's just a, a rosy glow to the drum. It's predominantly a low frequency conductive hearing loss, but I spoke to you about Carhartt's notch. Now Carhartt's notch is where your bone conduction threshold at 2000 hertz predominantly um, 
dip. So we've got normal bound conduction and then you get this dip at 2000 hertz and a recovery. Now, so the, the bone conduction is about the same level as the air conduction for that right ear. Now that doesn't mean there's a sensory neural loss at that frequency. Carhartt's notch is an, an artefact that occurs because we've got an increased mass on the ossicles. That increased mass affects the conduction of sound through bone conduction. So if somebody has this distinctive pattern, um, if perhaps when you're doing a case study that they, they mention that other family members have had progressive hearing loss from a younger age. Um, it may be that you know the likely scenario is that they've, they've got otosclerosis, not that you would tell them that, but you would certainly refer them back to the GP um, for assessment by an ear, nose and throat specialist. People who go on to have surgery for otosclerosis, so they have a stapedectomy where the stapes is removed and a prosthetic stapes is um, put in the middle ear. Uh, often the hearing returns to normal and this bone conduction returns to normal as well. Because as I said, it's not a sensory neural loss, it's an artifact of the conductive, um, an artifact of the condition. Um, so it's quite a distinct feature of otosclerosis. Also reduced tympanic membrane compliance, so a, a shallow type A tympanogram. Any questions about that? There is a, a link to a stapedectomy surgery video. Once again, um, once again, it, 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 you know, it's a bit of blood and guts there, but it's really interesting to watch. So I'd recommend you have a look at it. Barotrauma is another problem that occurs um, and can, can cause a conductive hearing loss. It results from um, sudden changes and significant changes in atmospheric pressure. So you get an increase in pressure in the ear canal. That increase in pressure causes a tympanic membrane to rupture. And it can also result in swelling and, swelling and bruising of the mucus lining of the middle ear. So you know, you know when you, if you go in a plane, Often it's a little bit difficult to equalise pressure in your ears, particularly on landing. It's more of a more of a problem when you're descending. If you can't equalise the pressure, your station tube's not functioning very efficiently. You can end up with a, a barotrauma as a result. Um, you can get a perforation. If somebody has a cold or your station tube dysfunction, that is one reason that. Um, Specialists or doctors often recommend people don't fly because they may be more prone to barotrauma. And in some instances, you can end up with um, sensory neural um, issues as well. Leone, in terms of fixing itself, um, the uh, if it's perforation, yes, quite often the perforation just heals um, by itself. Uh, if there's more extensive involvement, and that's usually not the case, but I guess in some instances you might have some problems with the ossicles, it may be uh, a bit more difficult. Um, but that's something you would monitor. Um, the bluish eyes, Mark, I um, actually have to look that up. I can't tell you uh, what causes a bluish tinge to the eye. I don't know whether Je Jeanette, yeah. Yeah, perhaps because of the excess calcium deposits um, in the body. Okay, I'll, find, I'll, I'll look that up and find it out for you. So barotrauma, physical trauma can both have a similar impact. Um, you may get a, a fall, a hit to the head, trauma from a cotton bud. It can result in perforations or partial or total disarticulation of the ossicles. Um, and the audiometric presentation is very similar to barotrauma. In some instances, you may also have skull fracture. So if someone had a bad fall, um, or they you know, hit on the head with something hard, or perhaps in the case of a, an explosion. If there's a skull fracture, depending on the orientation of the fracture, you may also have a severe or profound sensory neural loss as well, or, or may develop. With Barotrauma, you may see um, you may see a perforation, but you may also just see um, hematoma, blood, 
within the middle ear space. So in this case, this, um, this sort of mark behind here, this redness behind here is is bleeding. And you might monitor this person. You might do um, audiograms over a period of a few weeks, and you might see that uh, the the conductive hearing loss um, improves and the hematoma reduces over time. As I said, you can also get a perforation, so the extent of the hearing loss will depend on um, whether there's a perforation, if there's bleeding, how much is in the ear. Um, the audiometric presentation is, uh, this is fairly typical with uh, barotrauma or tra uh, physical trauma. Um, you often see a high frequency hearing loss and that tends to be more common if you've got, um, if the ossicles are dislocated. Um, you get that more of a conductive loss in the high frequencies. On tympanometry, you also see what we call a type AD tympanogram. Do you know what, can you understand what the AD means? And that a shallow type A, you don't get much movement. A deep type A, or AD tympanogram, is where the, the eardrum is pretty much flopping around. So um, there's a lot more movement, it's a lot more flaccid. So they're just some of the conditions that can affect the outer ear and the middle ear. That's a summary of them. I have got some references at the end of this presentation. There's one reference particularly to a site by Sullivan and that has a lot of images of different things affecting the middle ear and audio, audiograms associated with that. So it's well worth a look at and there are some videos that you can link to from there. With conditions that affect the middle ear and the outer ear, almost always the, the presentation is as a, a conductive hearing loss, but the degree of the loss and the configuration of the loss will depend on the structures that are affected. So uh, if, if it's just the eardrum, if it's wax in the ear, you might get a mild to moderate loss, but when, um, when you've got things like the ossicles being involved or with very large perforations, you can get an almost complete conductive hearing loss. So any questions? As I said, I recommend you look at those videos in your own time. Go through the references. I've got a list of them here. So there's R.C. Sullivan. There are a couple of sites. Um, Sullivan has, so this one down here and here. There's some other um, surgery sites as well that's, uh, that are well worth looking at. So one on congenital atresia, so, and, and that gives a little, a little bit more information for you. But as Jeanette said, um, YouTube is a great resource, so um, have a look on there and see if there's anything else. If there are no more questions, we might stop, uh, no questions, we might stop the recording. Uh, you can access the recording.